Hello, and welcome to the Stein Seedcast. Today's episode features the Best of the Yield Plus Corn Tour with President Myron Stein. Ride along with Myron as he travels across the country, meeting with growers who are combining elite Stein corn genetics and super management techniques to maximize corn yields. In this episode, we revisit some of his past interviews and highlight some of the best management strategies these initiative growers employ on their farm. So let's get started. We're going to talk to Ryan Kristofferson, and Ryan Kristofferson's in Southwest Minnesota. And one thing Ryan has done is he, he's taken the Stein high performance, shorter statured, high population genetics, and he's utilized the traits or the, you know, the qualities of those genetics to maximize his yields on his farm. And so we're, we're going to talk to Ryan. We're going to discover what different things he's done to hit these high yield numbers that he's had the number of years he's had while working with Stein. Hello, we're here today in Southwest Minnesota with Ryan Christofferson. Uh, We're gonna learn about 95 to 108 day hybrids and learn about Ryan's uh, techniques on managing those hybrids on your farm here in Minnesota. So let's talk some about the farm. It's a fifth generation farm. Tell us the history behind it. You know, how, you know, know, a little bit about, I know you were in the military for a while, you came back to the farm. Tell us all about that story. So I grew up um, just a quarter mile down the road, and, and where I live now is our family's, you know, farm where we homesteaded. And my great grandpa emigrated from Norway, great great grandpa. So I'm the fifth generation. My great grandpa built here. My grandpa grew up here. And my dad grew up here. So uh, I left. Uh, I graduated from Clarkfield High School, and I left, and I went into the Naval Academy. And uh, there, I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree and went into flight school. After that. Um, I initially flew a reconnaissance plane, and I went into, after that, I went into uh, F-14s, and I flew F-14s, and uh, later in the Air Guard, F-16s, for five deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. So I spent uh, the better part of 20 years, right at 20 years in the military, and came back here in 2003, and uh, basically started farming with my father. So we're, like I said, we're about as, you know, blue and tried and blue in the agriculture as you could possibly be. Sure. So, you know, and as a pilot, there's something you do on your farm that a lot of farmers do not do. And let's talk about that as far as your application. Yeah, so this year we added a, a spray plane business. And uh, we, myself and a partner of mine, started a spray plane, a turbine spray plane up business from scratch. And that's really not for the faint of heart. Um, we went through <laughs> the entire state of Minnesota licensing process, the FAA licensing process. I hadn't, uh, I, you know, I left the military with multiple thousands of hours and almost 400 aircraft carrier landings, but I hadn't flown in 10 years and I didn't have any ag time and I didn't have any tail dragger time. So basically I had to just jump in a, and there's no real mechanism to start with zero time and jump in a turbine airplane for ag because it just, most people that have the kind of time I have don't go fly spray planes, you know. So what we found was with this high yield system, if you don't control every single operation all the way through, you pull one operation out, you're not getting the benefit of the entire system. So it's very important to have the right timing on the fungicide Mm -hmm. as well as the insecticide on the soybeans and and get a good job done. So the only way I could really control that was by doing it myself. Do it yourself. And uh, I started on November 2nd with the process. And on on July 15th, we got our certificate from the FAA and we started spraying on July 21st. So uh, it it took a long time. I mean, it was very technically difficult to get that up and running. And, and you, had, you had to get your tail dragger. I had to get my tail dragger. I mean, I, had to, I hadn't flown for quite a while, and so I had to get all my quals back. I had to get all my military time transferred <laughs> into the civilian world. And, you know, it isn't, it isn't so simple. But, uh, yeah, th- and that's, um, that's kind of what we're learning. If you're going to go into what we're doing, you pretty much have to control the quality from start to finish. There's yeah. no area where you can leave to chance. You know, your comment on 9714, for instance, is, you know, fungicide and insecticide and being very timely with that. Mm-hmm. to assure that you have a, have a good stand or, or a remaining stand at harvest is, is essential. Yeah. So. so what we're doing is we're protecting yield potential with fungicide and insecticide. So that's kind of what we're really after is, is protecting what we have out in the field. It, it does give you a yield benefit, but it varies hybrid by hybrid. But if you don't protect it, you don't get it in the combines, everything else you do makes no difference. Yeah. Let's discuss some important 
um, aspects of, of what you do on managing Stein hybrids on your farm. And you do some very unique things relative to some other farms out there. You know, the first thing comes down to a yield goal. So how do you set your yield goal or you know, what does that mean to you at this point? Um, our yield goal, uh, we're targeting 250 bushel average on our fields right now. And our yield goal is set up by the Iowa State calculation of harvested ears mm -hmm. and stand times your rows around times your length of your kernel okay. divided by roughly 65 to 110,000 kernels per bushel. So when, when we look at a hybrid, our main goal is repeatability. And we're taking these Stein hybrids, putting them in your higher population setting. And that's kind of how we set our 250 bushel average. So once we hit our 250 bushel average over our farm, then we're gonna set another goal of 300 bushel. And what we're finding out is some of the newer numbers as we're able to push the varieties and push the maturities and push the population, we're starting to see some fields hit our yield goal. Okay, and, and, and when you talk about that yield goal, You've mentioned to me before that um, that means you have to have areas on your farm that are over 300 bushel, probably to have that 250 bushel yield goal. Is that correct? Or that is correct. Um, that's the difficulty. So as we push our populations, we push our inputs. Now all of a sudden we're seeing a point where we're we're getting a, ret a maximum amount of inputs and a maximum yield. So a lot of the getting high high bushels, a lot of it is raising up the lower averages because, like we discussed earlier. To get a 250 bushel yield goal, you have to have just as many acres at 300 bushel as you do at 200. So you can't have anything under 200 bushel an acre or you're not gonna be able to hit those higher numbers. And not to say we don't hit that as an average over every single field, but that's what we're pushing towards. And as we incorporate new management techniques every year, um, it, it's one thing to hit a yield goal like that over a quarter or 80 acres but it's another to do it over several thousand acres. And what we're looking for is repeatability and reliability is primarily what we're looking for. Sure, okay, so, so you set your yield goal. Um, tell me, you know, on uh, seed bed preparation, is there anything special you do there or? Well, you know, it's the old standby of making sure that, you know, you don't go out on the field too early, but the preparation starts the year before with the tillage before, and it starts with what, what shape your field is in for drainage because the drainage sets everything you know, okay. right off the bat. If you have low quality drainage, you can't go after these big yields. Sure, okay. Is there anything else you think we need to discuss about the secrets of, of growing high, high yielding corn? Well, I guess it's like I've said this a couple of times, it's attention to detail. No detail can be left that can't be investigated and, and benefited. Because if you look at that equation we talked about, you've got your final stand times your mm -hmm. kernel around, times your length, but then you divide that by the kernels per bushel. So we're attacking all of those all at the same time. We start with something that'll give us at least 16 rows around at V6. And then at tassel, we're giving the plant everything it needs so it'll pollinate the kernels. And then at planting, we, we have hopefully the final stand you know, that we're gonna take into harvest and then we protect that final stand. And then as we, uh, as we make more passes and as we we, our management gets higher and higher and we target test weight and we target different things. Basically, we're trying to take that from 85 or 90,000 kernels per bushel down to 75,000. So we're going at the, the entire equation on every single level, basically. And that's the only way you can get to high yield because you can't have any spots in your field below 200 bushel. You know, you know and tell us, so, so on 9655, it's a 108 eight day hybrid. And you can have test weight issues here with that hybrid, right? Yep. You know, if you get an early frost. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what you'd mitigate those issues. Sure. You know, you know what, you've, what you've learned in the past. So last year, um, right now on September 7th, this 108 day corn is half black layer. We were out in the field earlier. We looked at some of these. Mm -hmm. So last year on September 16th, we got a, a frost that killed the corn basically from the ear and up. Mm -hmm. and we were very lucky because with the high population, we had a very large plant mass. And when it killed the plant from the ear up, there was still enough left from the ear and down that was green in order to fill it. So we ended up with 97.14. Uh, so fungicide is one of the things that keeps a lot of moisture in a plant. And a plant with a lot of moisture is much more difficult to freeze. And a plant with, you know, with a field with a huge amount of plant mass, it's much more difficult to freeze. 
So what we found with the 9714, it was a little less plant mass. We were a little bit lighter on the test weight, but the 9655 filled with what was in the stock and we were able to still get 60 pound test weight. So, you know, the further north you go, the more variable it is. And I would say we're probably about on the edge of growing 108, 109 day corn, but we're still able to do it. And if we can reduce our variability, that will give us higher probability of success. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing what you're doing with some of these later hybrids. So Ryan, uh, you talk about growing high population corn, it's attention to details. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not just on how you manage the corn, but on how you really manage your equipment, you know, you, you manage everything on your farm. Can you give us an example, just like a, like a sure. small example of something you do, and it's, it's a minute, it's a minute, you know, item, but it makes a big deal in the whole scheme of things. Sure, uh, growing high population, high volume corn, there's no one thing that you're gonna do that's just gonna give you 50 bushel. It's 10 or 15 things that give you a little bit or preserve a little bit. So with farming, I believe the farm finance system is about 15 to 20 years behind where it should be because everything is a one year cash flow. So if you spend more on inputs, it has to give somewhere. Mm -hmm. So our goal has been to take money long term out of our equipment by keeping our equipment running longer. Plus, if you keep spending more and more money on equipment, what good does a high population do you with mm -hmm. more yield? So if you spend more to get more, you've got a big problem. And then the one year you don't get more, it's disastrous. Yeah. So what we've done with our equipment is uh, set up essentially a military style preventive maintenance program where we fluid sample, rebuild on schedule, and then when we rebuild, we take components and we'll a lot, in a lot of times rebuild them to higher specifications and quality than the OEM parts. And for example, uh, the sickle blades over there, we got tired of getting five foot chunks of sickle blades in and when they do, they bevel them and then put a sickle on top and it always breaks where the bevel is. So we actually uh, imported from Germany the sickle bar and we've got a 3D mill there where we put the sickle bars in and drilled our own holes. And now essentially for one eighth the cost, we have unlimited sickles. And that in itself is really no big feat, but if you replicate that and multiply that by a hundred, basically all these things add up. So we went from eight or $900 or a thousand dollars per sickle bar down to less than a hundred. And if we keep doing that, over the span of the machine, what it does is it lowers our cost. It's the same with the 3D mill. When we have bad bearing blocks or we have something that needs to be fixed, a lot of times the parts aren't available now. So we'll actually make the part with our 3D printer, I mean, with our 3D mill. Yeah, I think, I think those small details are what make the difference on, on your farm being profitable and, and looking into the future, you know, all, you know, all those things. That yeah. makes all the difference. Well, a good example would be our, our fertilizer floater. Um, high wear item, a lot of corrosion, you know, a lot of real, it's a difficult piece to keep running. So we rebuilt one at six years and the first rebuild was about 120,000. And I bought another machine and I rebuilt it and they're identical machines. But the second rebuild I did was under 30,000. And hmm. when you have a, a, a floater ripped apart in here with 10,000 pieces and it's laying on the floor and everything's tore apart, we build back better basically by putting in uh, hydraulic hoses that, that uh, have abrasion resistance 300 times greater than the OEM. So we never have a hydraulic failure anymore because we don't have the hoses break. You know, the, the, rubber corro the rubber breaks a little bit, the fertilizer gets in the steel braids and then the hose blows apart. We don't have that anymore. We haven't had a down day with a floater in probably six years and my floater is 12 years old. And we just figure out ways to keep doing rebuilds. And as we rebuild, we increase the quality of our components and lower our cost at the same time. But if we don't, control our dry fertilizer and, and we don't have the timing of it and we can't store our fertilizer, it's very difficult to enter into a high yield system basically because that's one of the things that you need to control. You know, all, all these things really, they're almost an art. You know, farming's almost an art yeah. at, at the end of the day. So. Well, we treat, we treat our equipment as a program and you know, we've had discussions about the military when they buy a piece of equipment, they don't just buy a piece of equipment and say, well, hope the dealer has parts. You know, you're, you're mm -hmm. in the middle of the ocean and you are days and days and days away from getting any part. And we'd fly, the first Tomcat would fly on and it would go down to the hangar bay and it would just be taken apart. There'd be a wheel laying and a canopy laying and all the parts would come off it and they would go to support the other airplanes. So at the end of a six month or an 11 month cruise, when they put it back together, we all did rock, paper, scissors as who'd fly that thing off the first time <laughs> because it's essentially a whole new airplane. And we kind of we have that mindset here where what we have 
we have an expeditionary mindset with what we have when we start a season is what we have on site, and that's what we rely upon. Anything we can get in is a bonus, and it's, it's helpful, but we don't count on anything that isn't on site when we start a season. And that's uh, proving to be an awfully large benefit now in the area of the, the stressed global supply chains and not being able to get equipment. I didn't realize how important it would be to operate on an island, but that's what's happening now in agriculture. Sure. So Ryan, tell us, we have to know, tell us your, your lowest field average <clears throat> of corn since you've been farming and then your highest field average on corn? Well, as you know, uh, we've been planting stein for the better part of six or seven years, and we were extremely frustrated getting hybrids that were variable, that, um, that we didn't have the knowledge and engineering data behind them. So one of the things that I've uh, appreciated most is looking at some of the numbers that you give me so I know how to place those hybrids previously. Mm -hmm. So in the last couple of years, uh, we've had some larger fields, half sections, 320s, I've had one of them go in excess of 250. Hmm. However, um, about 10 years ago, we it wasn't stein corn, but we had that same corn go 220 on one quarter and under 100 on another, and it was a failure of the hybrid. It was a specific lot. So with a high population, high input system, we value, um, we, first we have to quantify it, we have to measure it, and then once we measure it, we can assess why this happened and why that happened. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't do us any good if we have 250 on one field and 150 on another because that's a 200 bushel average. So the repeatability of high yields across the field to field to field is what we're striving for. If I spend more money in a high input, high yield, high environment system, if I don't get it back, I've just traded one problem for another. So our whole goal has been to reduce the cost of our inputs because we're putting more inputs on and then get more consistent yields. And we've all had fields that are within a mile or two of each other, 40, 50 bushel more. And we're quantifying why that is on a lot of those spots. So that's the whole trick with this high yield system is to, is to get repeatable high yields. It isn't to get the one-offs. I mean, if we hit a grand slam, that's fantastic. But if I strike out three times as much, my, my average is lower or below. And that's, that is one of the limiting factors on the high input, high yield system is you have to be a lot more, you have to have a lot more attention to detail and you have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah. And then on planning date, anything on planning date? Yeah, my great grandpa used to say, if you can pull your pants down and sit in the dirt, that's just about right. So 50 degrees, he was about a 47 degree guy, but he could tolerate that, you know. <laughs> but as far as uh, the last couple of years, we've had some snow and some after planting. So we target right about that 50 degrees. If we're getting in the field too much before, now we're just, we're just risking our stand. And as far as the yield goal goes, the stand is about 75% of your final yield. So if you have a poor stand, you're already, if you have 50% stand, you're already basically, you know, 35% is as good as you're gonna get towards your yield goal. So we're very cautious and we're very careful when we plant. We also look at the five and 10 day forecast to make sure we're not gonna dip back down and get some snow. But clearly the earlier the better. We're, we're pushing some 107 and 109 day hybrids up here. So we obviously have to get in the field as fast as we can. All right. Without so, harming our stand. And then, then so nitrogen application. So we've talked about that <clears throat> some in the past, but what, what are you doing? We're doing that? fall ammonia. Um, the new Minnesota rules have come out and we're west of, of a lot of the areas that are gonna be limited for fall application. So we're doing a split application of ammonia in the fall, and then we come back in the spring with some uh, urea on top. So we're trying to, we're trying to get the, the plant growth. As you know, uh, the, at V6, your kernels around are set at V6. So we're hoping by at V6, that plant has plenty of nitrogen and has all the nutrients we need so it doesn't limit us on the kernels around. Because you wouldn't think when the corn is six, eight inches high that that's gonna be a, you know, a portion of a yield component, but it is. That's huge. So yeah. if we end up at 14 around instead of 18 around, you know, you're gonna take off 150 kernels or so per cob. Okay, so, okay, so then on population, on population is probably without a doubt the, the biggest thing you focus on here yeah. and, and what you think is probably the future of growing corn and getting yeah. high yields. So we, we probably met, what, seven, maybe eight years ago, mm -hmm. and we've been all Stein now for probably five years, mm -hmm. and we've had dozens of hours of conversations about hybrids, you know, the height, the plant height, the ear height. Mm -hmm. So what we're after, essentially, is moving our population up from the low 30s where we were several years ago. My father's been narrow row higher population for probably the better part of 25 years. He started this system, but
But the problem was we didn't have the corn. The corn was 15, 18 feet high in some spots where they're, they're really, when you go narrow row, your corn gets to be much higher than it would normally be. So the traditional hybrids weren't working for us because they were getting too tall and the ear placement was too tall. Also, um, what we're really targeting is roughly 600 kernels per cob. If we get much over 600 kernels per cob, then we have a difficulty getting the cob in the combine. The yield might be out there, but we don't actually see it. So what we're after is, you know, something along the lines of, you know, some of these hybrids like uh, 9655 here, that's 16 around and 36 long. So we have about 576 kernels on there. So <laughs> we want to see the 40s, low 40s, mid 40s, and that's what's pushing our yield at that point. But that comes with a whole other thing so we can support 45,000 you know, plants out there. What we don't want to find is a gigantic year that has 800 kernels on that stands until the 5th of September and then falls down before we get it in the combine. That's why we've kind of steered away from the, the wide flex hybrids of what a lot of other companies are offering. And that's why we've kind of moved to the, to the more moderate flex, but then you have to get, make sure your population is high enough and you have to be careful for planting and you have to make sure you have good high quality seed because any one of those things allows you, or any one of those things stops you from getting a good stand, you're right there. Everything else you do after that is marginal at best. And then, so when you look at these hybrids, you have 9545, 9546, 9714, 9655. Yeah. And uh, you had a comment earlier about this 9545, which both of these hybrids, we had a limited supply of them last year. They're, they're newer genetics. Um, a number of the newer hybrids we have coming out are, are similar to these hybrids. So tell us a little bit about what you've learned about this 9545 relative <clears throat> to, say, the 9714. Sure. The, going, going a step further back, the first number we saw from Stein that really gave us the yield punch that we were looking for was 9538. Mm -hmm. And that was a little bit wider flex on, on the rows around, but it pretty much stayed constant at 36, but we could flex to 20. Now, 9655 is kind of a continuation of that with real heavy test weight. Um, the, what we're seeing out in the field right now at 9655 is, is 16 around by 36, which is giving us about 576 kernels. So if we have a final stand of 30,000, that's giving us right around 200 bushel. Mm -hmm. So every thousand stand we have is roughly seven bushel. So if we wanna punch over the 250 range, you know, we need to be up well over 35, 36,000. So if we have a final stand right around 40,000 with this number, we can start to push those numbers quite a bit. 9714, so we've planted 9655 and 9714. We've planted that for probably four years now. Mm -hmm. And 9714 has really been a tremendous number for us. Mm -hmm. um, it, for us, it's topped out vicinity of 40,000. So we're seeing some really tremendous yields, but these two numbers, got us to where we want to be now, but the new genetics with what we've seen out of 9545 and 9546, they're kind of pushing in the direction that we want to go. Because I believe within a handful of years, we're going to be able to take these numbers well into the mid forties is kind of what I believe. Um, this is the first year we've had them. So we're still learning about them, but that's why um, you've been on our farm now for four years with your plots. And in general, you've pr pretty much doubled your size every year. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why we wanted Stein here was to take a look at our ground, see our management techniques mm -hmm. and see what we're doing because we wanted to actually help determine in, in the direction that Stein moved with their hybrids. Because this is, this is what we're trying to see. For example, 9545, that's uh, 16 by 36. So that's the same size cob as 9655, but it's mm -hmm. about three feet shorter. The air placement is about two feet shallower. Mm -hmm. We need to look at the test weight but if we can take that population well over mid 40s, we're gonna be pushing 270 to 280. Now, 9546 is the same. It's a little bit less girthy. It's only a 14 around, but it's 42 long. So we actually have 12 more kernels on this year than we do on 9545. And, and this is also a very short hybrid with a very short ear placement. So these are, these are where we wanna be, the size of the ears that we want. Mm. We just need to take them. This is our first year. We didn't have, all, I only had a couple boxes of each one. But these are the style of hybrids that are gonna allow us to push in the higher, higher population, which is gonna then um, determine our, our starting point of the yield. So if we plant higher populations, we still have to support these hybrids and fill them. And that's, that's kind of where the true art comes in, is how to take 
how to take what you give the farmers and how to turn them into 250 bushel plus. Because if you take any one of these numbers and plant in the high 20s to low 30s, you're probably not going to be overly mm -hmm. enthused. Because yeah, be, that's not what these are for. You'll be pleasantly or you'll be very unsatisfied. Yeah, that's not what these are for at all. Right. So, in, Ryan, what about singulation at planting yeah. at these higher populations? It's very, very important. Um, we run planters that are mainly stock but have the insides in to give us extremely high population. We run through all our meters every year, and if we're not in the 99 and a half percentile before we leave the shop, then uh, we, we change it out. We have extra meters on hand, so we don't fix anything in the field anymore. We just slap another row unit on it and we get going. But w with the high population, high volume system, if you pull any one of 20 different things out of it, the whole system falls apart. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing that we need is extremely high quality seed with high germination and then a high singulation. Mm -hmm. If we lose a lot of the population right off the bat due to any one of 10 things, then we have trouble, you know? So for everything you do, there's something good and something bad because these ears are moderate flex. Um, some of the earlier numbers that you were, were using for high population were almost fixed. Um, mm -hmm. Like we talked about 9540 was, was basically 14 around by 32 and I looked at thousands of ears and it would never flex. Mm -hmm. And that was a fine number up to a certain yield goal, but that wasn't a number that we could take and push. So without a very wide flex on these ears, you're limited to having make sure you have enough population. So singulation, and we've talked about that probably three, four hours this year, right, earlier. The singulation and yeah, high yeah. quality seed, if you don't have that, you can't even start the system. Sure. Basically. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at these hybrids, all the hybrids you planted this year, out of everything, if you pick two different Stein hybrids that are your favorite to manage on your farm and what, you yeah. know. Well, that would be 9714 and 9655, only because we planted them for a couple years and I know exactly how to position them. I believe that 9546 and 9545 will be the style that we move forward with. Mm -hmm. But being as it's a first year, you know, you need to get them, make sure they stand, make sure the test weight's good. Sometimes just getting them off the cob, you know, I mean the dry down, you know, it's the whole deal. But right now, you know, the 9714 has been our highest yield and the 9655 is, with enough population, the 9655 is right on its heels. And, and you probably like the 9714's plant plant stature. I do. Best. I do. Shorter. And it's a little bit lighter on the test weight and a little bit harder to get off the cob, but the 9655 doesn't flex quite as much. So they both have their idiosyncrasies on how you coax that last 5 to 10% out. For example, the 9714 responds well to fungicide. So if we can give that stay green and we can give that plant everything it needs at the very end, then the 9714 mm -hmm. gives you that last little bit. Whereas the 9655, which is one day later, it dries down faster and has higher test weight, but it doesn't always respond to some of the increased inputs the way the 9714. The 9714's just got a little bit more top end in some of those spots where it flexes to give you the top end. Great, yeah. I would call that yield plus performance. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's bad. Did you like that? That can't be in there. I like it. It's definitely a good thing. Don't take that out of there. Sure. <laughs> I just uh, had to do that. Yeah. I love that. That's, 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 to make the, that's to make all them happy. I'm laughing. I'll, I'll bring your coffee here real quick. Sure. Um, uh, Ryan, thank you very much for having me here today. And it, it's been a wonderful time. I always learn something you know, about, about farming and, and, and really a number of different topics when I, when I visit with you. Thank you for coming today, Myron. I appreciate it. We're speaking with Mitchell Roars of Roars Farms, and they're in Northwest Ohio, and they use 105-day to 115-day Stein hybrids on their farm. And they're a very good example of, of a farm that uses super management for their corn. Hello, so we are here today with Mitchell Roars of Roars Farms in Northwest Ohio. They use 105 to 115 day Stein hybrids. And hopefully we learned some things about how they're managing those hybrids and, and, and extrapolate some secrets out of Mitchell today. So Mitchell, first tell us some about your farm, your family farm, when did it get started? Just some details like that. It's a very interesting story. Yeah, my family had moved down here or moved over here from Germany in the late 1800s. 
Uh, they settled in Henry County, Ohio. And then uh, my uncle had moved down here in 1974. And we were actually the, he was actually the first person to ever farm the marsh out here. Yes. He was able to clean it up and then um, was able to put tile in it and then started growing some onions and uh, potatoes. And then now we grow uh, processing carrots for Campbell's Soup. So, so out here. Yeah, so you do carrots, soybeans, yeah. corn. Yep, we do corn, corn silage, uh, processing carrots and soybeans. Okay. So. Now, on this farm, yeah, you know, I see I see like a shop and mm -hmm. you know, you do a lot of your own work with equipment. Yeah. And you see some progressive growers doing that, some growers don't do that, but I see you do a lot of that. Can mm -hmm. you can you talk some on why you do that and 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 how that's evolved over time? Yeah, uh I think more than anything just um cost effective it's just it's we've always been the type of people to we needed a new carrot harvester one time we had just built our own carrot harvester mm -hmm. we went and got measurements from asa left and we were able to make kind of our own and um we've got to keep guys we need so many guys in the fall as truck drivers so we can offer them a full-time job by servicing all of our equipment we do everything on our planters everything on combines everything that tractors um so we normally we stay almost too busy sometimes and so. so it's about economics. It's yep. about economics. Yep. In today's world, you need to do that. Yes. To, to be Everything is a lot more expensive than it was a year or two years ago. So Okay. Now, Mitchell, let's get into let's get into your Stein hybrids. And mm. let's we're gonna try to get some secrets out of you on what you're doing because you get some amazing performance out of your products and you get some amazing yields out here. So mm. let's first hone in on what are your two favorite hybrids? Uh, 9709 and probably 9734, the, the two, our two favorites right now because of the, the versatility of 9734. And then, um, the more 9709 and the more long range of it, we can mm -hmm. kind of, we can plant that, you know, early on in the season or later and it'll still dry down enough for harvest. And that's one, if you really feed it well enough that it really has top end yield on it. So let's talk some specifics now, you know, you, you're in 20 inch rows. Mm-hmm. 20 inch rows. As far as a yield goal, do you, you know, before planting, you know, as you're, as you're planting the season out, do you have a yield goal like by field or by farm or? Uh, yeah, we're pretty spread out. We're 30 miles in all directions. So not really quite a farm goal itself, um, but more of a, a field goal and how we can kind of, you know, mitigate that, uh, mitigate the risk and what varieties we know have performed before or will perform good on that type of soil as well. So seed bed preparation. Mm -hmm. Now there's something you do here that's unique relative to, to a number of growers out there. Let's talk about seed bed preparation. Yeah. So we are, we're trying to move over to hundred percent strip till. Mm -hmm. uh, we strip till now our corn acres. We're, we're probably 80% spring strip till. And then the rest we do in the fall. Um, so we're putting, we try and put everything that plant needs in a strip in the spring. And then we try and, why we like Stein is we can run a really high population on that and really feed that corn exactly what it needs. And then um, sometimes we'll come back and we'll wide drop and side dress if needed. Um, but some, depending on the weather and things like that, a lot of times you could almost put all your fertilizer up front in the spring and that'll get you through the year. And, and on strip tillage, you know, where you are, I'm assuming you're trying to heat that strip up too. I mean, there's yeah. there's some benefits Open to that. Open it up. Yep. Do you have certain ground here where that's that's a necessity, or does that not really matter going from your tougher ground to your? I wouldn't say it really ground? matters. I think the biggest issue we've had is some of the clay hills we have here are so tight that a 570 horse tractor won't pull it going up the hill. Really? Yeah, in the spring. So you got to do some of the fall. We've been trying to incorporate more cover crops as well in the fall and then come strip through the uh, cover crop in the spring. And it seems to, you know, soil breaks up a little bit better, not so compacted, not so tight in the spring. Let's talk about planting date. Mm -hmm. So planting date in general and this geography, it, it will help the viewers understand, you know, what you have to do here in, in Northwest Ohio. Yeah, so we normally try and start April 25th to April 28th planting corn. Um, last few years hasn't really worked out like that, but we've always tried to go April 25th, April 28th to May 15th. Um, last few years, it's it's been so wet, we haven't started until middle of May. We try and hope we can get done before Memorial Day. Um, but I've planted corn 
full time for I think five years now after I took over from my dad and I've never not planted in June. So, and actually in 2019, we started in June. So, <laughs> nitrogen application. So, mm-hmm. I know you put, you'd like to put everything on with your strip tillage. Mm-hmm. Is that really, is that reality? I mean, do you think you can always get that done? On certain farms, I think so. I mean, everyone has a good farm, everyone has a bad farm. I think on mm-hmm. those poor farms, I think you could feed it enough because your top, say your top end is only 190 bushel. Mm-hmm. You know, no, I think that's pretty easy to do. But you get some of these other farms that you really want to push it and you want to see 280 corn, you know, then I think, yeah, I think you almost have to put enough down in the spring strip and then uh, starter with the planter. Then you come back and side dress at that V5, V6 if you have a wide drop bar and then another late season application, if you really want to get top end yield out of it. Sulfur. Do you put in sulfur with yep. your nitrogen applications? Yep. Every nitrogen application gets sulfur, whether it's in the strip. Um, we've done it on the planter, uh, wide dropping, everything. So, so every single time, which, yep. yeah, that's, yeah, we've, we have found that, that that's a practice that's essential on, yes, it on, is. on what we consider super, super management mm-hmm. of, of these hybrids. Yep. Now let's talk about population. Mm-hmm. 9734, 9709, uh, they're going to probably be different on your farm in general than 9714. Mm-hmm. So let's let's start with 9734, 9709. What type of populations, what type of finished populations do you want um, when you get done? Uh, for 9734, it depends what kind of dirt I'm putting it on, but I hope to, I try and stay right around that 40. Thousand um, ninety-seven oh nine. I will push a little bit more, um, depending on the fertilizer program we have in place for that f- that field itself. Um, we'll push that to forty-two, forty-four, okay. um, normally, and I'll I'll normally do the same with ninety-seven fourteen. I'll I'll try and push that to forty-four. Um, the only, yeah, the only issue with that is um, we have seasons like we've had early. I I like to grow some one hundred and two day for silage and 102 to 106 day last couple of years it's just been so dry is the only problem here is right. normally last few years we first started growing sign 9714 was one of the best varieties we had but now for some reason we've changed of weather weather patterns we've just been getting so dry in the summer and it just takes that top end right off right away and it's it's definitely 105 days so yeah so it's your it's your on the early side and we're 9808 is on yep. your late side. Yep. You, you do both those hybrids, but you don't want a large percentage of your acres yep. in something like that. On fungicide and insecticide, mm-hmm. anything is the same program across your farm. Is it? Is it? Do, do you change that up? Uh, we change it up. Um, we've done a lot of testing with putting a fungicide down, a cheaper fungicide like a strobin for northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot on a V five V six. And being in 20 inch rows out here, get hot and humid, you have no airflow in between those rows. So we'll try and spray a fungicide on early um, to kind of help it out. And then um, we'll normally do one right ahead of tossel or at brown silf, depending on the disease pressure we see coming through. Sometimes if it is a really good farm and to try and keep that plant alive, we'll do one ahead of ahead of tossel and at brown silk. Okay. So. Okay, great. Well, Mitchell, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us mm-hmm. and talk about how you manage your your super management of corn on your farm. That's it's, mm-hmm. it's exciting to see that. I wish you the best on future years with with high yields, mm-hmm. and I think you're going to hit those regardless. I'm looking at your corn around here. You're saying it's dry, but uh, I, I've seen some amazing mm-hmm. stuff with what little rain you yeah. you've received. So so thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, today we're speaking with Jason Mollers, and Jason's in northeast Iowa, and Jason's in uh, Narrow Rose, high population environment across his entire farm. It's a great interview. It's a great a great example of somebody else pushing, using super management techniques to push their corn genetics to the next level. Hello, we are here today in northeast Iowa. We're going to visit with Jason Mollers. On Jason's farm, they use uh, anywhere from, well, the heart of his maturity is 98 to 108, but he does do some 90-day material. He does actually do some up to 112-day material. So very excited to see what Jason does on managing his Stein hybrids. 
Well, Jason, yeah, thanks, thanks for uh, meeting with me here. So tell, you know, tell me a little bit about how you got farming, about your family farm, your situation, you know, what's happened over the years. Well, I got farming basically because uh, we grew up on the farm. Mom and dad were farming. It's always been in the blood. I was actually got out of high school, went to tech school for mechanics, worked for a mechanic for a couple of years. I actually switched to a factory job because it allowed more time to be at home helping the brothers that were running in a partnership. And uh, back in 1988, the one brother bought a farm, the partnership broke up, and uh, mom and dad come to me and asked if I wanted to run one of the farms on half and half, and uh, so why not? So uh, that's where I got my foot in the door to start. Uh, I actually did all the pencil work, got my FFA books out doing your cash flow, and dad asked me when I wanted to do it, and I said, uh, I'm not gonna make any money. <laughs> and uh, he literally, which, you know, you're at the age you know so much, and dad don't, but uh, he, uh, he says, sat down, he goes, to be honest with you right now, farming is very poor. But if you think down the road you might want to be full-time farming, I strongly suggest you doing it while you're working because at least if you do go full-time farming, you'll have a bin full of corn or grain or whatever. If you go full-time farming straight out of the gate, having to buy all your grain in Northeast Iowa, you pretty much need livestock to sublet everything else. If you got to buy everything up front, he says, you're going to be so far underwater, you, it's going to be difficult to make it. So although he goes, your profitability in 1988 is really, really bad. He says, if it's your long-term goal to be able to get into it, I suggest doing it. And so that was my first year. It was a drought year. We did not do good, but uh, it got my foot in the door and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, so, so you started in one of the worst times of, of agriculture and, and, here, and here you are today. And so tell me, what do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy being a mechanic or growing corn? Well, I enjoy both of them. I, I uh, work on a little bit of stuff at home for a few people and work on a lot of our own equipment, although the technology is getting to the point now that there's stuff you can't do. Sure. But uh, I've always enjoyed the mechanical work, but yeah, you can't beat farming. I says, you got, uh, the only thing that beats is Mother Nature and the Nobody can control her, so that's all right. It's changing all the time. The neat thing about farming is every day is just a little bit different, but you're always trying to beat last year. And in the last oh, 15 years, uh, I got to know a few other people. Uh, there's actually a group of us on Marco Polo, and we're giving a hard time back and forth all the time. But we pay attention to what everybody else is doing, trying to find out what's working for them, what's working for you. It's an actual goal of beating last year. And it's one of those things that gives you the momentum to, to keep going. And you, ne you never have the same year, do you? Oh, you never have the same year. I've, well, it's been since 88, what, 33 years, and there's never been two years alike yet. So tell me, so uh, you've been growing Stein corn for many years now. Today, what would be your favorite Stein hybrid? Uh, as of today, the portfolio they got for my region my number one go-to hybrid on bean ground is 9655. Uh, partially because I've been in the 15 inch rows, it is one of the hybrids that can handle higher population and it pays. Uh, we've checked it side by side, 30 inch rows versus that, and uh, it goes. I haven't found its top end for uh, stand, uh, but I start limiting just to make sure you're safe for wind damage and stuff like that. So it's my number one go-to hybrid on that. Uh, the corn and corn, there's a few other hybrids I like, uh, 9434-11. So on 9655, let's, let's talk about that hybrid specifically and let's talk about how you manage that hybrid. So right now, okay, you're going into 2022, you're going into a new planning year, yield goal. What type of a yield goal do you place on that? Or how, how do you even develop your yield goal at this point? Well, my yield goal is to try to successfully, uh, over a broad area, pull it, pushing the 300 bushels an acre. I've done it several years in test plots, 
but uh, I haven't been able to successfully do it across the broad acres. Uh, so I actually learned from a couple other agronomists and stuff like that, take an area, extremely work with that, push that small area to see the maximums rather than trying to push the whole farm because otherwise you might throw a lot of money away. Sure. Okay. So I do a little bit of that. That's why I said I, I like 9655 because it handles the population. It has good yield. It has uh, a pretty good agronomics. Um, you do have to watch with any hybrid pushing a lot of population when it starts slimming down. But uh, my actual ultimate goal is to, uh, I should be safe, it was the same as years ago, trying to cross 200 bushels an acre. It took me five or six years to actually have a way wagon way out on more than a half an acre, 200 bushels an acre. I know in Illinois, I know other places, there's groups where the 200 bushel club, I couldn't do it. I says, but now, and I talked to a lot of my friends, a lot of people farming, if you're going across the field and you look at the monitor and it's not over 200, you get mad. You're, 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 you're disappointed. It, it, it's, it's, and there's reasons for it, there's no question, but now that she successfully got over that, the next goal is 300. Like I said, I've had several hybrids in test plots over 300. 332 was my top, but trying to find the niche economically to do it. And so you can throw the whole kitchen sink at it, but sure. it doesn't do any good to spend $1,500 an acre and get $1,200 back. So, it's yeah, not so, gonna work. So, so, so you're going for 300 bushel corn economically. Now, let's talk about some other details like seed bed preparation. You're, okay, so you're in you're in 15 inch rows. Yep. Seed bed preparation. Anything special you do there? The the you the uh, seed bed preparation for me isn't different. It depends upon the field. It depends upon the previous crop. It depends upon what I've done prior. What I mean by that is, I do a fair amount of no-till corn into bean ground. Mm -hmm. Number one reason for that is we're in the hills and bean ground is the best thing to grow corn in that I've found other than actually ripping up some alfalfa or some oats. Uh, the bean ground is great to grow corn in, but in my hills, even at no-till, heavy rains like to start ripping the ground up. Mm. So I no-till as much as I can corn into bean ground. Uh, if it's corn on corn, uh, we pump a fair amount of hog manure. My best handling of the hog manure, we, we used to just chisel it in with a drag hose. We were doing that, but uh, I found if I actually go in and deep rip it before that, it soaks it in better. It covers up. I, I feel I'm losing less that even though we're stirring it in, we're covering it up, not 100% gets covered up, but after we went to working the ground first, you got three minutes behind you and it's gone. Mm -hmm. It soaks right in. So when I get into ground like that, obviously next spring it's soil finisher. I says to try to keep my bean yields up, uh, it's kind of changing due to fertilizer cost. Next year's gonna change just a little bit again, but I'm actually on a corn, corn, bean rotation. I'm not on a corn bean rotation. Mm -hmm. Part of it's soil erosion. Part of it's about a third of my acres every year we cover with manure with the drag hose. Mm -hmm. So that gets worked. Mm -hmm. Gets worked in, handled mm -hmm. manure. But I've actually got parts that I do no-till corn on corn. Um, yes, there's particularly a good possibility a 10 bushel hit, but by the time you worked it twice, you're not out a lot. Mm -hmm. The management on corn on corn no-till is a little different. It's a little particular with the planter. I like these guys with high-speed planters. I do not do that no-till on corn on corn. You got too many lumps you're running over. Uh, but the, uh, the management, watching disease, things like that gets a little bit stronger on no-till corn on corn. But the uh, probability of it is it's, it's been working. That is not my highest producing ground, but it kind of goes into the flow of what I'm doing. I think the corn, corn beans has given my beans a possibility of a three or four bushel bump. Oh, sure. I, yep. I can't prove that, but going to history with some of the other people, I know guys, corn, bean, corn, bean, corn, beans, 
their ground is different. It's not the same as my ground, but there's guys that struggle to get 50, 60 bushel beans. So I, I can't answer, I'm not running it for them, but. And soybeans don't have the, you know, they're not hybrid. They don't have the heterosis to, to fight the disease and everything. Now on singulation at planting, do you really pay attention? I mean, I'm sure it's an important thing for you, but is there anything on singulation? Do you, you run your seed through a test stand or do you just double check it when you're planting? What's your, what do you do there? Well, I try to do the best I can. I, when I went to the 15 inch corn, I went to a John Deere planter. It just seemed like it was gonna fit the seed drop to seed drop because I'm on the contour all the time. That was gonna keep my 15 inch rows more accurate. I wasn't 100% satisfied with their seed drop, so I actually switched it all over to precision. I don't know if it's given me as good a benefit as they claim, but it is more accurate in the field that I've found. Other than that, I'm doing the best I can. It goes down to conditions, field prep. Like I said, I don't plant at seven, eight miles an hour. I've actually got a lot of no-till ground that I'm three and a half to four miles an hour just to try to stop from bouncing and everything else. The next thing that comes to seed space and you have to watch is your vacuum pressure because when you're in 15 inch rows with cells that are basically set to run 30 inch rows, when you're running that much slower on the disc, sometimes you gotta have a little bit more vacuum pressure, otherwise you'll actually drop some because they're physically turning slow. Other than that, the planter's been checked over, we've had them on the stand, we, uh, we do the best we can. Now, planning date, which is, you know, we're, we're in Northeast Iowa, What's your optimum planting date for 96.55? I like to do our best to have all corn in the ground by May 5th. Back to Northeast Iowa, two years ago, May 13th was the first corn we put in the ground because we were too wet. I don't believe in pushing the planting date to plant in April if conditions aren't right. If Mother Nature says the conditions are right, this year I think we had all the corn and beans in by May 1st. We go as soon as we can. I plant for my nephew and my brother, as well as myself, and we go to the first field that's fit. Okay. We don't say, hey, you're first, you go there. Uh, we go to the first field that's fit to start, and we work, o work our way around. Nitrogen application. Now this is, so, so you, have, you have manure that you use. Tell us some on, on that whole, let's assume the 9655 is going on a field with manure on it. Let's assume that. So tell, with, us, uh, tell us what all you do. With the manure, it, it varies a little bit when we send the sample in, because depending upon if, I have an earth storage pit for my hog buildings. Uh, according to the guidelines of an earth storage pit, you have to empty it twice a year. Well, the limits they make you build it, you don't have any choice, because it, it's gonna Fills run up. over. When it comes to adjusting the nitrogen, number one is, what did it test? If you have a year to get extra 10 inches of rainfall during the summer, those catch a lot of water, so your, your nitrogen in your manure actually changes a little bit. Barring any changes in the manure, my fall applied manure, I'll usually add 20 to 25 pounds more of anhydrous on fall applied versus the spring applied. Just do, because you, you got more time, you know you lost a little bit more. Other than that, if I'm on corn and corn, I'm shooting from anywhere from 200 to 250 pounds of nitrogen taking off whatever I get for manure going from there. Uh, on bean ground, I basically give a pound credit for whatever the yield was. Uh, they say that's not 100% true, but that's what we've done for years. If Again, if I apply some manure on it, I go off of that. But on my bean ground, I'm usually adding 150 to 170 units. Varies, like I said, on what, uh, on what the beans yielded the year before. What about sulfur? Do you put sulfur in with your anhydrous? I, do, I don't put it in the, the anhydrous. I mean, I mean, I put it in the anhydrous, but I mean, do you, do you, do you say, okay, here's, a, here, here's my anhydrous application. I'm gonna count some sulfur for that. I don't do it according to the anhydrous. Uh, I do a little bit what the soil samples say. Again, it goes back to the manure because the amount of manure I pump, I basically cover every acre every third year. Mm -hmm. Again, that kind of comes into the corn, corn, bean rotation. So I, that's three crops. Uh, I cover about a third of my ground every year. You get a fair amount of sulfur there. On my other ground, 
it's been varying. Uh, I've went to very little to some years I'll push 40 pounds of sulfur. Let's talk about population now. 96.55 on a field you've, you've got your 250 units of nitrogen on it. What's your population? How, how, do, how do you determine that? And, and maybe walk us through, I'm sure it, it varies from field to field or? It varies from field to field. According to this year, Mother Nature and all the uh, meteorologists had us so scared that we were gonna be the hottest, driest year ever. So I actually dropped an extra two or 3,000 plants per acre because they had me scared. Mm -hmm. Now, as of today, although we were really dry, I, I've got a few fields I wish I'd have stayed up another two or 3,000 plants per acre. But uh, the 96.55, I still haven't got 100% where the specific is. Of course, Mother Nature throws a wrench in there all the time. But if I'm comfortable that they're talking reasonable moisture, not excessive heat, that is a number that some years I'll push 48,000 plants per acre. Wow. The safer years, I'm at the 41 to 44. Um, I've kind of been feeling that 40 to 44 range is uh, trying to let the ear flex, trying to do a few things like that, doing the best I can. Again, it comes down to economics. If we got high priced corn to sell next year, if that extra 4,000 plants per acre gives me another 10 bushels an acre, it pays. If we're at $3 corn, now your whole equation changes. That's, that's why when you ask, where's my specific population is, you got a whole lot of things that you throw in there. And sure, sure. Once the planter hits, all of a sudden this and this and this adds up, this is kind of where I'm at. But I got about a four or 5,000 plant population window I'm in. Still, still a big art. Still a big art. Fungicides, insecticides. That's been a topic of uh, variability for quite a few years. Um, when we first started using, I was still in 30 inch rows and uh, I had the guy come in and we flew crossways, across the test plot. That year, every single hybrid had a bump. The top one was 25 or 27 bushels an acre. Not all of them were. Some of them were only six or seven bushels an acre. Since I went to 15 inch rows, I watch it closer. Um, I have the, the, the agronomist and the uh, places I'm buying my products from uh, basically one phone, phone call away to, are you gonna do it? Aren't you gonna do it? Uh, I walk my fields a lot. And if I see some rubbing on leaves because you're closer together, if you're seeing some open sores and the probability that it looks like you could catch it bumps me up a little bit higher on the fungicide application. Um, but over the last five or six years, most of our acres, even before we went to 15, were getting the fungicide because we've been seeing enough bump to cover it. But once again, that's one of those things that $3 corn versus $5 corn, if you're talking 10 bushel an acre yield bump, that's 50 bucks yeah. versus $30. $30, if that's all you're gonna get out of it, it's a wash. Uh, it, it, it isn't worth your time, so it's, it varies every day. Well, Jason, thank you very much for, for sharing how you do super management of your Stein hybrids. You're in that high population arena. You're walking the fields every day, correct? Pretty much. Well. There's very few days that I don't walk out there somewhere and see what's happening. So you're, so you're, not, you're not scouting from your... From your pickup window, you're actually walking into the field and checking them out. So thank you for sharing that information. It was excellent to hear that. I hope, hope the viewers take something from that on how to manage uh, high population corn. Thank you for having me. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from Myron and the innovative growers who are combining elite Steinkorn genetics and super management strategies to maximize yields. Thanks to all our listeners for joining us on another episode of the Stein Seedcast. We'll be back soon with more expert interviews and insights about all things Stein. To never miss an episode, subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found.